welcome to our next seminar or, or, or series of presentation about the uh, scale-up model. So um, it's a pretty burning question to all of the innovators how to do with um, less after effort uh, and to get the maximum um, result from the activities that you're doing in order to scale up your solution and not only in your, your respective country but also to go cross-border to other countries. And um, since it's um, so this, this today's event is, uh, is a, a part of uh, the project called Innovation for Active uh, Innovation Networks for Active and Healthy Aging, then it's really important to talk about uh, how to scale up uh, innovative solutions um, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the active and healthy aging, uh, not to say for the elderly people. So uh, uh, today we will discuss about the um, uh, scale up model. And we have two presentations. One is um, an overview of um, scale-up models existing already before we even started to design this uh, project uh, a year and a half ago. But, uh, but um, yeah, and um, Trin Naudi from, uh, from the North Estonian Medical Center will give us an overview what we have in, 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 in the world of, of uh, scale-up models and how to use those scale-up models and what is, um, what is good and what is maybe should be improved and uh, what we could do differently from, from existing materials or scale-up models. And then we have a second presentation and, uh, and we have Marion Teder uh, talking about her experience how she decided or what she needs or what she's doing to scale up um, to scale up uh, her solution her company's solution called CareMate. So first we will start with uh, Trin and Trin is an expert from the North Estonian Medical Center so you knew exactly um, what it takes to scale up a uh, model, and you know this from uh, service pro provider side, but um, uh, perspective. But you have also studied a bit um, all the um, exciting world of uh, scale up models around us. So, the, the floor is yours, and and you can uh, you can start. Thank you very much. Uh, I will take over. <laughs> uh, hello from uh, my side as well. Uh, I am here to give a short overview of existing scale-up models and, and what can be learned. Um, and before we even start, I, I think it's important to note that it's uh, definitely, well, it's almost impossible to cover all scale-up models um, possible. So um, I'm here to give a short overview of some of them, uh, especially in the health and care field. Uh, but it's not a complete list of everything out there. So um, I think it, there's a lot more um, research and, and practical experience to, um, to take and to, to try to um, really come up with this uh, comprehensive model of, um, for, for this specific project. Uh, but let's uh, uh, start with uh, my presentation is not working. One second. Yeah. Uh, so yes, today we cover two uh, questions. First, what kind of scale-up models and frameworks already exist, uh, and what can we learn from these models? So the example frameworks and models that I uh, used and, and that I've analyzed um, are, are the following. There's the IHI scale-up framework, uh, the query implementation roadmap, um, the aided model of scale-up, um, the Scirocco tool, which is it's not necessarily a model, but it's a, it's a measurement tool for, for maturity, for, for scaling up and for implementation. And the SIMIT health tech innovation cycle. So let's, uh, let's quickly go through them one by one. Um, first, the IHI scale-up uh, framework, um, which was uh, created for health interventions and, and kind of scaling up from, from that side. Um, and it has different phases for, for the scale-up. It has the, the setup phase, um, just to, to prepare the, for the company or the intervention for, for scaling up. Uh, then it has the scalable, building the scalable unit phase, um, which is where you, know, you, you develop 
change like a change package and a, a scalable unit that you could um, further implement in other contexts and, and situations. So for example, if you take um, an intervention, you want to take it to a completely new environment, then uh, you need to have a set of variables that you take. Uh, then you go through the testing phase, so you validate um, this intervention or solution in this new context. And then after you have validated, you, you start to replicate the same process over and over again. Um, and I would say that it's a quite simplified model. Um, it doesn't go too much in depth um, and it lists the supportive mechanisms, so adoption mechanisms and support uh, systems in a very brief, uh, as a very brief uh, comment in, in the model. So it just mentions uh, aspects like leadership and communication, uh, social networks, um, and also learning systems and data systems and infrastructure. Um, but yeah, I think we'll later come to it again, but I feel like it's, it's a very simplistic approach to the model in general. And um, I feel like maybe there are some dimensions here missing um, that would be useful for the infor um, H AHA uh, model. Uh, second uh, model that uh, I've analyzed um, was the query, qu query implementation roadmap. Uh, this is again an interesting um, approach where they've kind of, in the model, they've simplified it a lot, but they have a very, very uh, detailed roadmap to go together um, with this model. And they use three different phases. So you have the, again, the pre-implementation phase where you kind of, um, you set your um, goal, you, you really figure out who are the stakeholders who should be involved in the process, um, what are the evidence practices, and, and you, it's an introduction phase. Um, then you go to implementation, uh, where you actually pilot uh, and implement the, the process, and then you go to sustainment. So that's where yeah, you start asking questions of how you can sustain and how you can scale the, the uh, innovation or innovative solution. Third model is the aided uh, model of scale-up, scale uh, which is very um, fluid model and again very simplified approach. So you have uh, five different stages. You have assess, innovate, develop, engage and devolve. Um, and as you can see the, the core here is using um, feedback loops and um, peer networks in the process. So um, you, you constantly have to be willing to go between the stages. So uh, like in the scale up process, I think one key aspect here is, is to think that every time you scale up, you could come up with another way to um, actually improve the service or product. And then you have to go maybe a step back in the, in the process and actually adopt the, the service or pro, uh, product to the new environment. So that's something to, that I think can be learned from, from this specific model. Uh, the fourth is the Skiroko tool, which uh, I think was a, a very different approach um, to a scaling up process or uh, m assessing the, the maturity for the scale up process. Um, and it uses 12 different uh, dimensions. Um, that you can see here on the on the slide as well, um, and and I think I'm not going to go through them all one by one, but um, I think if we take for example readiness to change, it has all of these uh, twelve different dimensions have um, their own assessment categories. So um, you you can actually if when you're going through the scale up process and and you take a specific context or a new hospital that you want to, for example, implement your product or service to, you can go through these, um, uh, these different dimensions and, and assess whether it's worth going uh, there for, for scaling up, whether there's readiness to change, whether there's uh, finance uh, and funding opportunities available, um, whether there ain't like any barriers in terms of technology or, or other IT infrastructure. So, it's, um, I think, a very comprehensive um, tool to use. And I think in terms of coming up with a, a roadmap for, for this specific project, it could be very useful um, uh, to, to go through. So if, if I just give an example for, for the readiness to change, I think the, there's like six different levels that you can assess. 
So, you know, if there's, for example, the level zero is that there is no, uh, even, they haven't even deci like decided that there is a need to change. And then there's next step to that is that they have decided that there is a need to change, but there's no actual plan to how to implement the change or how to, um, you know, they haven't ha come up with a process for the change. And, and so on. So you go through those scales and eventually you come up with this full overview of whether um, this environment is, is ready for, for, the, you know, for the new innovation or integrated service to be implemented in that environment. Um, another interesting um, example of a scale-up model is the CIMIT uh, health tech innovation cycle. And, and I think that covers um, a lot of the aspects also set out um, and uh, that was really interesting to look into uh, because that cycle is, is um, covering the full process. Um, so f starting from just the need and the idea and then moving on to proof of concept uh, and then proof of feasibility, proof of value, um, clinical trials, um, validating the solution, uh, eventually then the approval, clinical use and standard of care. Um, and what I liked about this model is that it actually shows how diverse that uh, scale-up process is um, and, and that you, it really uh, emphasizes also the need for the, the business uh, perspective and, and also the legal perspective. And the innovation cycle comes with um, specific checklists for, for each of these phases um, from the perspective of um, regulations, uh, technology, clinical efficacy and, uh, and legal barriers as well. So you have to always think in advance what are the steps that should be taken before you move on to the, um, to the next phase of development. Uh, so you wouldn't miss out on anything. So I think in terms of practical use, this uh, this CIMIT health tech innovation cycle is a is a very good example. So some key aspects that uh, were covered in in all five models and uh, something that just I think many of them are have already I think are quite clear and and uh, have been talked about a lot uh, even before before uh, this presentation. But just to to kind of point them out uh, again is that uh, scaling up requires a very active input and uh, involvement of all stakeholders. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's very, it's central. I think it's clear. I don't think we need uh, convincing of, of that aspect, but um, when we're talking about um, the, the idea of coming up with a scale, scale up model for um, the entire European region or, or kind of going um, from, from one local um, environment or ecosystem to um, cross uh, country ecosystems it's um, it's a very big challenge and something that just uh, I think the model and the roadmap should give an input to how to do it um, because it is central uh, second point uh, is that scaling up is a iterative process um, and so you need these regular feedback loops and an openness to, to change and adapt um, in the process because the failure to adapt could uh, lead to resistance um, in, in the process and kind of coming back to uh, zero uh, or, or coming back to, you know, taking a few steps back afterwards when you realize that uh, you haven't actually been able to adapt the new solution or, or process to um, the, the new environment that you're working in. Um, and third point is that solution providers must be aware um, of the regulatory and cultural and even like to just to emphasize the cultural barriers here um, early on uh, to manage risks. And, and that's to say not necessarily cultural, cultural barriers in the context of um, like a whole new country, uh, but even between different institutions within one region, uh, because there could be a culture um, in terms of what, what it, in a large hospital, the kind of culture and openness to innovations versus a very small um, primary care institution um, where you know, the, the attitude towards innovative practices could be different. 
Uh, some strengths um, that I saw from the model in, uh, in this context uh, of, of this project specifically um, are emphasizing the need for diverse support systems. So uh, bringing in the, the dimensions of learning systems, uh, human resources, infrastructure, uh, data collection and reporting mechanisms. So um, really not looking at it just from the business perspective or, or just from the, uh, you know, let's do a clinical trial and then start implementing and, and going uh, to all these different healthcare uh, providers. But really uh, understanding that um, the attitude towards innovation could, can be very different um, depending on the um, level of awareness or knowledge that the people have, for example, about technology. Uh, because not all doctors and nurses are uh, know, have a good uh, enough uh, uh, vocabulary and knowledge of, of how technology works and, and how they could really benefit from, from using these technologies. Uh, and second point uh, is encouraging the use of, uh, of both qualitative and quantitative data collection and monitoring. Um, so it's not just um, collecting numbers about uh, how many people have started using this product. Um, but it's also about asking and interviewing those people about how they feel about the change, um, what are the challenges, what would they like to um, maybe do differently in the process. Um, and, and using that again, it comes back to the iterative process. So you have to be um, open to, to modify and adapt uh, in those various contexts. Uh, and third is also using this uh, checklist approach that I mentioned with the SIMIT model, um, just to, to make sure that uh, you cover the most important milestones uh, in key areas, so that you don't forget uh, the aspect of, of business planning when you're trying to uh, find your way around the, the clinical trials and the regulations, um, and, and also that you don't forget about the clinical side and the technology um, because uh, if, you, if you start moving too fast in the scale-up process and you forget um, some of those stages, it, uh, it could be very difficult uh, later on. Uh, some challenges um, uh, and some maybe things that I was missing from these models uh, when I looked, looked at it from the perspective of, uh, of this uh, project um, was missing detail first in the financial perspective. Um, so a lot of those models, well, they were developed for a different context, right? So for, uh, for some of them were for health inter interventions, for example. So they didn't go fully into the business planning and, and funding opportunities, which are very important when we're talking about um, uh, facilitating the, the upscale process of, uh, of, for example, healthcare startups and, and other technologies in, in Europe, you need to understand where you can get money and, and funding for, for this process because it's a long and complex process. And especially if we're talking about different countries, then it's, it's not only national health insurance providers, but you also need other sorts of uh, financial support, uh, both short term and long term. Uh, also missing the aspect of how, how different factors are interrelated uh, and either facilitate or inhibit the scale-up process. So um, as you saw, the, the models are um, quite simplified um, and, and they, they show or display those different aspects. But I feel like uh, it would be interesting to try to come up with a model to, to show more of how to, uh, what are the aspects that um, can kind of block the process or, or maybe just boost the process uh, more and at different uh, time points or checkpoints. And thirdly, also missing the, the maybe the European perspective uh, and also the regional differences. Um, and I think this kind of reflects back to the challenge of, of this model uh, and coming up with the scale-up model eventually because it has to be detailed enough to be practical um, and to have yeah, like practical value to, to solution providers um, and uh, to other stakeholders as well, but also um, at a high enough level that it can be adaptable to very various contexts. And I think that was something that, um, that will be an interesting challenge further on down the road when, uh, when the scale-up model is going to be invented. Um, but I think it's important to point out here that um, 
it's it's a very very important uh, question to keep in mind in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Trin. And um, we will have a short discussion after uh, after the second presentation. But uh, for the audience, you can drop your questions in Zoom chat box, so you can ask directly from Trin or uh, or from Mario as well from their experience in using scale-up models and um, yeah, Marion, it's your turn now. So you have really practical experience how to scale up um, or you are, you're about to scale up your solution in the nearest future, I hope. So um, let's hear uh, your presentation first and then we can have a discussion. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Marion, I'm the CEO of Germate and um, I hope the presentation will be ready as well. So first I would like to tell you um, about why I'm involved in social care, uh, what problem I'm solving and then um, about uh, how we are doing it with CareMate uh, platform. And uh, I was asked today to come here to speak about our scaling model and uh, what are the challenges that uh, we faced uh, when we actually tried to become international going to the UK market. So uh, actually we all know that uh, like we see healthy aging and uh, we all know that uh, elderly people there need some time in their life uh, more uh, supporting hands and uh, uh, we all have parents who do so, uh, but uh, these days uh, we don't really have so much time to our parents to really uh, be there for them or whenever they uh, would need. And the same, of course, is a problem with all sorts of different chronic illnesses, uh, owning people and also disabled people. And I happened to uh, study social politics uh, in Estonia and also I ended up going to work as a social uh, supporter for elderly and disabled people in, in the UK uh, for about five years. And what I learned there uh, was that uh, it's, uh, it's of course a nice uh, subject of uh, being uh, there for other people and giving care to the people there, but uh, uh, in the market, there is really big uh, uh, underfunding problem. Uh, there are uh, big problems about supporting the people who are there for the others. And uh, the stages when the help actually starts being received. Um, so the traditional model is broken. And especially now in these uh, COVID times when uh, less people are motivated to go to elderly, elderly people's homes to, uh, because they are the risk group. So what I decided to do was that uh, I tried to find innovative, innovative solutions uh, to start fixing these problems. And uh, when I started studying uh, MBA program in Estonia, then um, uh, all this uh, ecosystem here was quite supportive for innovation. Even the Ministry of Social Affairs in Estonia was organizing uh, here uh, different accelerators and, uh, and grant options to raise uh, investment to solve Estonian uh, uh, social care uh, problems. So we came with uh, me and uh, found a team together to the uh, model uh, that uh, actually uh, will bring uh, interest to people to be the service providers uh, and motivate them in every way doing so, but also for the people who need care to start really having this like a more of a prevention level than when it's really already too late. And we created this platform, uh, which is uh, matchmaking, communication, scheduling, payments, uh, tracking technology with reportings. So when someone who is willing to help someone will be happy to go and uh, provide uh, services, uh, which don't have to be only personal care, but also companionship and uh, taking to outdoor activities. As we know, these things uh, for elderly people, they do affect a lot their health in physical and uh, mental state. 
and uh, and then uh, on the other side the people who need care it, it should be really flexible for them that when they really need and how much they really need they will be able to get so this model was quite successful in Estonia and how we actually uh, started uh, with this was that uh, first we had to set out uh, the KPF performance indicators and uh, also then um, uh, find out the market product fit for, for, uh, for the solution that uh, we were having IDF to bring to life. Uh, when doing so, we had to start from zero with uh, just uh, really going very agile method to speaking to people, seeing what uh, they would be willing to pay uh, for this, uh, who would be willing to pay for this. Uh, we gathered that uh, there is really a big uh, difference in Estonia compared to UK about uh, the funding options that uh, uh, come to when it uh, is uh, needing uh, care for the family uh, and the stage when the people are going to look for it. And then we got to the proof of concept and uh, as soon as we had this, we built up a prototype to test the market uh, in Estonia. We always thought that the Estonian uh, proof of concept uh, should work uh, in other European countries and West countries because in Estonia, we didn't have such solution for having uh, supportive helping hands at homes uh, before. And it's like uh, bringing up completely new service to the market comparing to other countries where uh, there are agencies that provide this service from, uh, from 70s or, or even a longer time ago. Uh, and as soon as we uh, got the market uh, approved, we, uh, we got funding, we, I got people uh, in Estonia uh, to get it going. We were looking uh, now that uh, we should uh, go abroad to take the next markets. And uh, then rising a little investment to get market product fit uh, in the UK was the plan. Uh, and the next plan would have been then uh, scaling up. And what was the challenge, what we ra uh, faced uh, in this uh, was that, uh, of course, UK is uh, 10 times bigger market uh, or even more than Estonia. But um, uh, when we come to speaking about uh, legislation openness for, for uh, this kind of solution, I knew that uh, it would be completely legal to go with this uh, platform uh, to the UK. But uh, I didn't understand so clearly about the issue of trust that we have to build in, uh, in the users and where they look for help. And wherever we try to build this up uh, to get the first early adapters to our platform, they all asked if we are registered in uh, local uh, care and quality commission department. And to do so, we should uh, take many steps back to go back to traditional model. And we were uh, facing this challenge a lot in uh, not only by uh, uh, speaking with private people, but also with local authorities, uh, with uh, support organizations, uh, uh, or trying to go and really speak even with the NHS. Um, and uh, we understand that uh, these circumstances uh, was affected also because of the pandemic time. And uh, there was uh, other big challenges for, for these departments to take as priority. Uh, but, uh, but really, uh, the openness there comparing to Estonia was uh, very different. And then uh, we decided that uh, we have to now make uh, up our mind what we are going to do and learn from this experience. And what can be learned is that, uh, firstly, uh, in this summer, I actually was talking to one uh, specialist who uh, was telling that 70% uh, of uh, startups, they fail because they are uh, trying to scale with their premature model, which means that uh, if you are um, actually um, trying to centralize or decentralize your model if you are trying to adapt with the market and be more flexible for changes rather than uh, going uh, with the existing model or if you are not so. Um, and the Estonian model in this sense did not work for the UK. The second is projects. So we learned that uh, 
thinking about ten times bigger co uh, country, then uh, okay, that is one thing. But uh, what it means between the distances from uh, uh, from uh, the service providers to the service receivers uh, and uh, the flexibility that we all have built in, that we meet everyone's needs. So uh, we didn't realize that for this we also need to think ten times bigger. And uh, so in the end we really had to come to a solution if we are going to need to change the product to adapt with the mar market more. Uh, if you would take it slow to really uh, try to go and speak more with the authorities to get uh, corporations, which will take probably many years, but our business model is uh, meant to grow fast. Or we should just change the market to the more similar market to Estonia. As far as we know in Europe, there are all the markets very different, so it is, uh, it is, uh, it is still a big question after two months for us to figure out. And, uh, and I will be very glad to see if there comes out something brilliant from this, uh, uh, this uh, what we are uh, talking here about, this uh, new model. Uh, thank you very much, and if you have questions, then <laughs> please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marion. Can, Trin, can you join us here so we can have a really short discussion about what... Uh, I think it was a really good example how to scale up and um, maybe not uh, be <laughs> so successful in, in this process and learning from it. And one um, specific point that uh, Mariam was talking about was building the trust. So Trin, you are also representing not only this like an expert about um, uh, scale-up models, but you are also uh, representing uh, one of the biggest service providers here in Estonia. So how it works to, to build up trust, trust uh, between the service provider and, and um, innovator, for instance? Yeah, I, I actually started smiling when, uh, when you said that it was difficult to build trust because that, that is the case. And, um, and I've thought about it a lot, actually, in, in, con in the context of, of my, my work uh, as an innovation project manager. And, uh, and having those people come to me uh, from startups or other other like innovation providers and coming up with those ideas and like hey let's let's do this let's try this you know you you you're, you have the clinicians we have the idea let's do it um, and and then you know on I am kind of in between there between like between the, the two sides of, of let's let's do this it's cool let, let's try it's innovation and then you have the other side where. Um, you know, medical medicine uh, traditionally is a very conservative um, discipline. It's uh, uh, it, it takes a lot of time to build trust there, and and I think in UK also going in, in any other country actually outside your home country, uh, you ha there's an even added question of trust because. Um, you're like, you know, are you trying to scam? You know, is is this actually like valid? Um, and and I think the, this is actually a very very important part of the scaling up process, and and that's something that I kind of meant also under the cultural barriers in in my presentation and and in the analysis is that like I think we underestimate the importance of cultural barriers because one thing is funding, and I think getting funding it's super important as well, and having the right business model super important, but if you lack the cultural context and understanding of those barriers and, and build like understanding what it takes to build trust. Because I, I, I mean, I, I think I have some ideas of how to build trust maybe now in Estonia, but I wouldn't know if it works in, in the UK. And so I think having doing that um, uh, pre-work or, or that research and actually maybe going to UK and talking and I don't know how much you didn't go m too much into detail how much uh, work you did uh, in the UK before you went there to their market but how um, did the question of trust come to you I would ask maybe <laughs> <laughs> like uh, uh, did the question of trust kind of um, come as a surprise when you were already in the market or was it something that um, uh, you already kind of you were aware of that this could be an issue beforehand. Uh, I would say that well, I uh, worked there five years, uh, so it's quite a long time, and I was very uh, uh, strongly involved with the service uh, providers and listening to them, like in culture of being British person giving care to other British person or other ethnicity, 
And uh, at the same time, I was very involved with the clients because uh, I was taking care of them and they were British and other et uh, from other, other ethnicities. Uh, so I never thought the trust would be issue. Uh, but when I actually started uh, finding service providers in there, then uh, first thing that faced us was that the British people are not willing to do this job because of the uh, uh, salary is, uh, it is just so slow. And, uh, and then Brexit happened and less people abroad want to go there. So it just hit like all together. And when I was speaking with the client side, then we did get some service providers, but they were, uh, they were uh, from not uh, Europe countries uh, and uh, they were not so big favor for the clients then. So, um, so it was uh, like you, rather than just finding like someone who is nice to you, lives nearby, is available, you also have to think about their ethnicity and uh, other cultural uh, interests and uh, if they have to be female or male and all these things, uh, they matter so much. So the, the cultural thing was not known really. Even I was been working there in this sector. <laughs> so I, I guess that uh, this should be one of the really important aspects of our uh, scale up model as well. It's just how to build trust. And I, I hope that um, the uh, work process we have in our project is um, that uh, there is an opportunity to test your solution in, in like in Spain or in Finland. This should also bring this information back about this building trust in, in those countries. So how it not only how the business model works, but also how to really how to promote your solution and how to show that uh, you are uh, what you are and you <laughs> You are doing uh, you, you you are doing good thing. The other thing that you mentioned was uh, it's also related to the um, to this trust uh, uh, topic uh, was this public private collaboration. Mm -hmm. So it was completely different from uh, what you experienced here in Estonia. It was completely different in UK. Uh, like uh, what was the like less lesson uh, the most important lesson you learned from uh, from the uh, from this public private. Uh, uh, was it like a different way of purchasing services or, 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 or what was the um, key question there? Yeah, uh, I learned that um, well, British people are very conservative and uh, they, uh, they require uh, approach from uh, people that they trust. So I should have found someone who they trust and ask this person to go to talk to them rather than going directly. And in Estonia, we never like experienced something like that. So, uh, yeah, that was good learning point. Again, trust issue. <laughs> Again, trust issue. Yeah, mm. because me, a female uh, founder from uh, Eastern European country, how seriously they will take it, really. <laughs> so, and also the uh, question of age. I mean, you're a young person. I think in. Uh, that's also another cultural difference uh, is, is actually taking uh, the, um, the age into the consideration in building trust. And, and also another layer is, uh, is whether trying to build trust with a clinician or, or with a stakeholder who is already into innovation, who is already in this kind of ecosystem and interested. And then it's another question of uh, building trust with someone who is skeptical and, and who, who is, whose first reaction is no but then you still need them on board. So, so how do you work around that? It's, uh, there's a lot of psychology <laughs> actually involved in this process. Uh, and, and I think it's important not to forget about that. Yeah, and then it, it was just, I loved your, your slide when you just pointed out all those uh, questions you had on the, on the way is um, the maturity of your solution. Like I, I think that this should be also something that we should reflect in, in, in our scale-up model. Like, uh, w what about the, the maturity? When are you ready to scale up? And in some cases, I, I believe that it can happen sooner. In some cases, it can happen later. But what if, if, you, if you think back, back at what was the information you needed back then uh, about your maturity that you, you didn't have, but uh, you know now that like this was the question I should have like get the answer first and then I can go to the other markets. I think that uh, trying to go with uh, the similar, uh, com completely similar product was a really wrong idea. I should have just uh, started uh, like from zero, like in Estonia with the same approach in the UK because they are very different countries. 
So I, I think that in, in um, what, you, what you're saying, I can hear that th this role of living labs in different countries is really important. When you, when you can actually access to this uh, living lab type of organizations where they can uh, provide your services, like you can test it, you can uh, evaluate your business plans, you can study the uh, legal environment of the country. So this kind of uh, support is really needed when, when you go to, to other countries. We well, think you, you could do this also by yourself. Yes, so uh, I used uh, these uh, accelerators in Estonia, but uh, mm. maybe I should have gone to one in the UK when I had the idea of bringing my business to UK at some point. But to be fair, when I started in Estonia, I didn't know which country we are going to choose because I just had so much experience there. That was just logical that we thought we are trying there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you had personal experience in UK, right? So you yeah. thought you understood the context, but then when you actually tried to to build the business there, it was very different from from the personal experience. Okay. Um, um, any other aspects you would like to point out or or or, or bring to the table? Like uh, you, as a as a really practical example here, um, what are the like key aspects uh, for you to be willing or th 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 yeah? My question is like, what it takes from us to build, uh, or uh, what kind of features or, or, or elements you need in this scale-up model for you, like it's important for you to use it, or something like, is it should be, I, I know, it should be simple, and then it should cover all the uh, important aspects. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how do this works, but what in, in your eyes, uh, like, what is really important? I think very important is to build a community of uh, connections, uh, definitely. And uh, because then if uh, from a trusted uh, community comes somebody to that country that is uh, collaborating with this uh, community, then the trust issue will be already uh, not so big issue. Um, and the other thing is, uh, is, um, is uh, I think tax systems and all these kind of like rules that in different countries work, plus like how public, uh, semi-public uh, or private market, different levels of uh, social care are, all these kind of things. Uh, we just have to learn like by ourselves, but uh, could be nice to really have this information in hand when thinking of some new ideas. So instead of narrowing down the uh, scope of the scale-up model, <laughs> you brought some <laughs> additional aspects, the aspects uh, to be the considered as part of the scale-up model. Uh, Trin, uh, you studied uh, all the, uh, not all the, but uh, scale-up models that you thought are relevant. Um, in your opinion, uh, what are the elements um, of the scale-up model that uh, we, we we should have in, in, in our project, that it really helps. Uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to get <laughs> here to, <just laughs> to narrow down the you scope You try to this. narrow it down, but it will only get wider. <laughs> I think the, the trick here will be to, um, uh, to choose how to approach um, the model, uh, because again, the like I agree, it should be narrowed down, it should be simplified, but we, sh we can't leave out important parts. And I think if you're talking about funding, private and public funding opportunities or, or the legal barriers, uh, the tax systems, or, uh, and also the, then the surrounding culture and the uh, trust issues, they have to be in the model somehow. We have to figure out how to do it. Uh, but I think it should, you know, we have the roadmap to go with the model and I think the roadmap will be where it's, you know, it goes more in, in depth and more in detail and covers even more aspects of, of each of those, um, those fields. But I think the, we can't really um, simplify too much either because if it's, if it's overly simplified then it, it loses its practical value. So I think all the, all the aspects that you mentioned earlier and, and, and together with the I think from, you know, as, as, a, as someone that works in a hospital, I think we can't also forget about the clinical side. So if you, if you, if you provide a service directly to the doctors or in a, in a very clinical setting, uh, you, you also you need the clinical efficacy and, and, and that aspect, the, the clinical trials uh, as part of the model as well. 
So I think we need someone that um, that uh, will help us uh, draw it. Uh, <laughs> but I think the ideas, and I think we already know the key elements that that should yeah. be in there. So that's true. So thank you, thank you, Trine and Marion. It was really interesting to hear like news from the field. <laughs> and and um, the next steps uh, with this uh, with this model, um, uh, what what we are planning to do is. Um, we expect all from all of you, um, from you, Trine and Marian, and also from the audience. We we are waiting for your comments and for your input um, to this model. So please contact us, and and you find the um, uh, find the uh, details how to contact us from our webpage and from social media. So let's get the um, process um, rolling and, and um, we should have the um, uh, model ready by the end of the next year. So we have a bit time, but also along the way we are planning to test it, uh, this model to have feedback and uh, to, to change it if needed. So I guess that, that by the end of the project we will have something tangible and, and usable for the, for the innovators, but, but also I hope that service providers and other stakeholders will find in important in information from the scale-up models. So thank you, thank you, and, and see you next time whenever we have this uh, meeting again or event. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for, for, for participating.